evening all greetings from indian society of anesthesiologists national headquarters and today is a very very important day i can say a day which will be highlighted in golden colors where we are celebrating the spirit of one isa one nation and the theme is reached the unreached it's a profound pleasure that today we have speakers from the northernmost part of the country leh ladakh and joining us from far down from andaman port blair so it symbolizes the spirit of isa it symbolizes the spirit of iscns one nation one isa i welcome on board president isa national dr venkat giri chairman isa academic committee dr molida joshi current president of society of defense anesthesiologists of isa dr deepak shrivastav immediate past president of sd isa madam rashmi datta and colonel raj garg the co secretary and also i'm joined by the class coordinators dr paru jindal dr nishant sai dr monica chikara and others i also welcome the speakers for today dr moru dr arjun joshi major arjun joshi and sergeant commander arijit it's really pleasure to have you all on board before i invite dignitaries to say few words let us kick start by showing the showcase of ladakh which dr moru is sharing with us happily and uh, Just please help me guide that if the audio and visual are uh, there. So just help me. Uh, that I hope the audio and visual. Are all good, Navin. All good. Summer we gets lots of the patient, especially the tourists coming from the different parts of the India as well as from European tourists. And uh, the lowlanders tourists comes over here, they get a uh, lots of uh, problems related with the high altitude uh, sickness diseases like a altitude promoedema, altitude cerebellum, and many other thromboembolic disorders. So we have been doing the studies regarding all these high altitude uh, sickness in this hospital. Sometimes uh, the hospital 
is uh, you know lots of the games comes over here from the all in institute of medical sciences as well as from the pj chandigarh so these camps have been uh, every yearly they are coming this is now more than 10 15 years and uh, we have been doing a collaborative study with the pj chandigarh especially in the field of anesthesiology regarding the high altitude sickness what is the effect of the profile at the high endurance and the low endurance we did some comparative study also and uh, this time the topic of my concern is to just a uh, hemodynamic change while doing a laparoscopic surgery so is there any difference between the laparoscopic surgery at high altitudes and the lower altitude hemodynamic uh, hemodynamic changes so we did the parameters of the uh, echocardiographic you know parameters we take it so that's i'm going to talk to you about That was the uh, introductory video from uh, the our very very enthusiastic and uh, anesthesiologist from Leh Ladakh, and I'm very sure they have reached up to ISA and IST has reached up to this, and we will our this association will go stronger and stronger. I invite Dr. Venkat Giri KM uh, to say a few words. Dr. Giri, please. You can unmute yourself now, Dr. Giri. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, uh, uh, Secretary Naveen, uh, Academic Chairman Mulundar Joshi, uh, current and past office bearers of uh, DSA, Dale Adak, uh, uh, colleagues, uh, friends. Uh, this is good the topic that at our, the end of this. Uh, Yes, a year or platinum jubilee year, we are having this uh, very important topic uh, uh, that is uh, anesthesia at remote location. We were thinking anesthesia remote location is now out of the OT only. That is in the radiology department or in uh, uh, X-ray department or somewhere in the endoscopic source. It's not that the difficulty of the people who are there. What is the difficulty? What are the challenges to give anesthesia in? Uh, such remote locations plus in that extreme temperatures uh, how the body reacts because what uh, where, where i am there now i am uh, sitting with the fans on this uh, but uh, heat when i'm going tomorrow there is such a cold area so that also is the fact when our body comes from this area going to that area there are a lot of things changes which we have not learned uh, for both two things is important one to know and gain a knowledge or pgs to get uh, through their exams and pass and uh, it's really good that uh, we have this topic and uh, we have learned uh, faculties from Leh and Ladakh and uh, they will be enlightening up and uh, already defense personnel will always have this uh, uh, going uh, to this remote location, Leh, Ladakh or in that Siyat in Glacier and all where you have to do that. But we have not seen this uh, difficulties. We have seen only the civilians in this uh, hot area. So it is a good opportunity for us. I wish that everybody will take uh, uh, opportunity from this and, uh, and improve and increase their knowledge and use in their, uh, you know, many times it's not only increase our knowledge, people ask us, what is they think that we know everything, but we do not know many things. That also sometimes we will have to tell them many times. So we should also know that the other day, somebody was talking about the cardiac uh, heart transplant. We, we, we not, but people like the lady who explained it so well that I thought that that talk should be like that but we should also have some knowledge about this and tell to others. And first hand, we should have knowledge to tell others. So it's good that we have this topic and uh, uh, see forward to hear you from uh, Leh Ladakh and DSA. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Giri. Yes, I must pay some you. record. 
<laughs> Dr. Moru, yes, I must place on the deep, deep record of sensor appreciation mm. for SDISA and uh, Dr. Moru and the team at uh, Lay Cargill and uh, today joining by so nice to people sir. also. And uh, mm. it was long due and uh, Dr. Yeah. Mulder Joshi had said that it should be done. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> over to you Dr. Mulder Joshi for a few comments. From, Dr. Mulder Joshi, please. Dr. Mulder Joshi. हिमालयन स्नो टू दंडमान निकोबार सी सो देर इज दू एक्सट्रीम ऑफ दी So once I've been to Andaman Nicobar quite long before it was ever that uh, you know cellular algebra. I still remember the Andaman Nicobar, and there's a small hospital. I also saw this hospital, so it is very pleasure to have a paper for Andaman Nicobar also, sir. So thank you, Dr. Navin and the President, the Dr. Uh, uh, Gandotharaf, for uh, giving me the chance of this, uh, presenting the paper. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Moru, and uh, thank you, uh, over to you, Dr. Mulidhar Joshi, sir. <laughs> i think I, i don't any words to say actually honestly <laughs> when i started uh, probably as a president elect i was up and took the charge at uh, bangalore as in uh, 2019 the whole theme was reach the unreached honestly honest that was a thing the theme on which uh, the, the then the governing council took the like you know vote saying that uh, we'll reach the unreached and this means basically question here is Some areas, probably we have been, we are not able to contact, we are not reached, or we never made an attempt, or something like that. In that context, we had uh, safe or safe, safe country. Then we talked of talked of um, personal well-being. We just put only four simple agenda: safe or safe, safe country. Then we said like innovation research. Then question is like overseas training, and the fourth one was professional well-being. But I, I, in fact, I used to be after Navin saying that trees and trees. Uh, Navin, we had to do each and all. i think one one task was accomplished was the, the national conference is being held in the northeast extreme northeast here that's meghalaya shilam yes people might say it's very far away it's fair there's no people are living there it's our country it's our country our people if we don't reach the seven sisters of our country who else will reach that point so that's one thing and second thing is i was after him also like to look for somebody in le ladakh and andaman and all those things And I, I told him like I should remain now on him. But again, he also was busy with the office. I think probably today both the dreams have come true. I have people from Ladakh also now from Andaman and Kerala. Uh, thank you, Navin. Thanks a lot because this will be the last session as academic chairman for the this particular scientific event every Monday which happens. It is going for more than seventy weeks. Am I right, Navin? Absolutely right. Absolutely. Right. Doctor Venkat will take over the chair in the fourth. It will go. It is. It's been great chair. But I am very happy, Navin. I could at least finally. Uh, see people, Dr. Morul and Dr. Uh, Arjun, I think Dr. Uh, Arpit, Arpit from Arjun, Arjun, Arjun from uh, Andaman. I think probably uh, thanks to you, but I think I would like to hear from all of you because I feel at the end of the day, if you ask me, last four years what did I accomplish? Yes, I could contact our official colleagues from Andaman and also from Ladakh. Thank you so much once again. Thanks for ISA. Thank you everyone, Dr. Parul, Dr. Sai for for taking care of all the responsibility. Thank you, Navin, once again. Over to you, back to you, Navin. Thank you, thank you, sir. Now it's a pleasure to invite President of Society of Defence and Anesthesiology for ISA, Mr. Uh, Dr. Deepak Shivastav, sir, to say a few words. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Navin, uh, and um, it's good to see uh, also uh, Dr. Mulidhar Joshi and uh, the President, uh, Dr. Venkatagiri. First of all, uh, like to thank you all very much uh, for uh, giving us this opportunity to host uh, uh, this particular. the academic session now uh, uh, you know i just want to uh, so share that um, i as a young captain mean young medical officer was in leh and i was just video that dr morup showed us uh, uh, you know the ladakh has transformed so much i never saw so much greenery i spent two years 90 and 90 91 of course i was not an anesthetist at that point of time uh, today and i also had the privilege of visiting andaman so uh, i can say that yes as sta as an army anesthesiologist uh today it's really a great honor for me to uh be the chair person for this particular cme session now uh, uh needless to say in fact it is visible for everyone that uh, how much of uh, 
you know, you even work is being done by our office bearers of ISA to bring the academic, uh, you know, map to spread the academic map all over the country. And uh, today we have two, you know, the top end and the, I won't say the bottom end, the two ends of the country which are united. Uh, and today we uh, and we got very good high quality scientific uh, content from uh, these two places so uh, that's all for me to say as an introductory comment and if i have the permission i think we can go on with the scientific session uh, 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 what do you say dr navin so it's a great opportunity indeed and uh, uh, i think it's going to be a great learning session from all the speakers for all of us i fully agree with exactly, you sir. sorry to interrupt and all but so much of green in ladakh it, it made my heart Absolutely, like, I, like, I, I, I didn't see. Like, I didn't exactly. see. So, I, I myself sitting in Udhampur and Dr. Yeah, Moruk, yeah. uh, I will request you to play host to me. I, I, you know, the ladies. Yes, yes. Yeah, 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 it's great. It's great. Yes, great. yes, sir. It's, it's great. It's been it's 32 great. years it's since great. I visited yeah. Leh. I lived there for two years, and uh, <laughs> uh, it wasn't green at all. Uh, exactly. I, I think a lot of work has been done. So that's great, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hats up yeah, to yeah. everyone. Hats up. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. In the I'm I'm hoping to have a physical conference next year in 2023 at Lehman. All of the industries from all over the India, especially our ISA group, we have to come over here. And I'm yes. a, I will host you, here and we will go to the Bangalore, sir. Definitely, and, you must and, come and, and see the Ladakh. And Ladakh we will have a lot, sir. One picnic by the uh, Shok River, which I which used to have <laughs> earlier in, in summer. Yes, it was wonderful. With fishing, with yes, with fishing, fishing. <laughs> and cold beer. <laughs> Yes. So, uh, so I think, I think we before, should just get before, up to the yeah. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Deepak Shivasa, sir. Before we finally go to the academics, uh, there's a message from Dr. Rachindatta also. So I'll play yes. that and then we'll move to the... Yes, she's not here today, but she's left a message for us. And yeah. uh, uh, message from Rashmi Dutta, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a historic moment today that our ISA Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a historic moment today that our ISA National Headquarters under the One India, One ISA banner has been able to connect the two extremes of our great nation, Ladakh and Port Blair. In the history of ISA, the anesthesiologists from these two remote locations have been given an opportunity to share their uh, experiences for the first time. Thank you uh, for guiding me. I'll just just. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a historic moment today I hope it is that now. our yes, ISA sir. National Headquarters under the One India, One ISA banner has been able to connect the two extremes of our great nation, Ladakh and Port Blair. In the history of ISA, the anesthesiologists from these two remote locations have been given an opportunity to share their uh, experiences for the first time. And this historic moment has been the brainchild of our president, Dr. Venkat Giri, and our secretary, Dr. Naveen. And I'm very glad that it has finally fructified today. As past president of the STA, I feel very elated and proud that my team STA, in such a short span of time, have been able to win hearts and the trust of the national headquarters. Today's theme, Unexpected Challenges Bring Unlimited Opportunities, is an apt theme for the kind of fortitude, the grit, the determination which our young soldiers sitting in these remote corners have, have displayed not only once but time and time again. And it is great that we have got this opportunity to showcase our uh, difficulties which we face 
to among uh, all the anesthesiologists of the ISA. Uh, I thank the president and the secretary for giving us this opportunity and I wish the young soldiers, the young anesthetists all the best. Thank you very much. So uh, it's time to move to the academics and I'll request Dr. Deepak Shivakar and Dr. Mulizar Goshi and Dr. Giri to please chair the session. And uh, I'll uh, request Parul to please introduce the first speaker. Sorry, sir. A very sorry, sir. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the PG online classes. The topic for today is unexpected challenges bring unlimited opportunities. It is my honor and privilege to introduce our esteemed speakers who, though working in the most beautiful of landscapes, they are facing extreme conditions. Our first speaker for today is So just a minute, sir. Dr. Uh, Sring Morup, he's a chief senior consultant at Anesthesia at SNM Lehi. He's completed his MBBS from GMC Srinagar and MD from SKIMS Srinagar. He's done his postdoctorate in cardiac anesthesia at Ames, New Delhi. He's done fellowship in ultrasound guided regional anesthesia and perioperative intensive care from PGI Chandigarh. He's a state nodal officer for uh, uh, for Ladakh for COVID-19 and oxygen and he's present at Mahavali Charitable Hospitals with seven publications. It's my honor to introduce, uh, welcome you sir. Yeah, myself, Dr. Murup, uh, working as a senior consultant at Sonam Nebu Memorial Hospital, Leh Ladakh. Now, this hospital is situated at the height of 3,500 meters and which caters more than around about a 3 to 4 lakh population of the UT Ladakh. And this is just a district hospital. It's not a multi-specialty hospital. However, in this hospital, we have been Shant, audio uh, are clear. having a, you know, uh, yes, sir. camps from uh, different sir. primary institutions good, like the... AIMS, All India Institute of Medical Science in New Delhi, as well as the PJ Chandigarh, and some others, uh, you know, uh, laparoscopic surgeons coming from the Max Hospital, New Delhi, and also some endoscopic and laparoscopic surgeons from the South Asian countries. So we have been doing a collaborative study with this multi-specialty, super-specialist doctor since last more than 10, 15 years. And uh, in anesthesia, most of the studies we have been carried out with the help of the PJ Chandigarh uh, primary institutions since last 10 years. And we had been doing a uh, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic changes in different. Drugs like a propofol <clears throat> and also many other topic of concern, which is more or less related with these high altitude sicknesses. And this, uh, you know, this part of the region is uh, very famous from the touristic point of view and lots of the people are coming from the uh, tourists are coming from the lowlanders which uh, somehow get the high altitude sicknesses like a uh, high altitude pulmonary edema, high altitude cerebral edema and many other thromboembolic disorders regarding in, in all the specialties. So this is the new disease which we had been doing a studies over here in, in this hospital also and today's presentation is more or less related with our anesthesiology so this study we carried out the topic of concern is to the trans esophageal echocardiographic assessment of hemodynamic changes during laparoscopic surgeries at high altitude and this we carried out with the help of the cardiac anesthesiologists coming from the pj chandigarh and some laparoscopic surgeons coming from the max hospital and the endoscopic laparoscopic surgeons coming from the south asian countries countries so we carried out this in the sonam hospital memorial uh, hospital yes and um, just to give a brief intro <clears throat> so, you know, the laparoscopic surgeries are rapidly involving due to the less possibility pain, better cosmetics, 
early return of the normal activities and shorter hospital stays as compared to the open surgeries. However, these surgeries are associated with various hemodynamic changes during various phases of the laparoscopic surgeries. These changes can be attributed due to anesthesia, positioning, and pneumoperitoneum, hypercarbia, or desoculation. Anesthesia at higher altitude is a correct uh, challenging job due to the vast variation in the physiology, which can further complicate it by the positioning and the pneumoperitoneum during laparoscopic surgeries. These changes can be better understood and managed uh, with the help of a echocardiography. Uh, now, in recent years, due to the development of the surgical uh, expertise and a better understanding of the pathophysiology of the pneumoperitoneum, it becomes possible to the, offer a laparoscopic surgery to the patients uh, uh, of having comorbidities with minimal morbidity and mortality. However, knowledge of hemodynamic changes in laparoscopic surgeries done at high altitudes is limited, you know. So the video has stopped, sir. Sir, the audio and the video both are lost, sir. Naveen, sir, the audio and the video is not working from that side. Yeah. Correct. No, it was supposed to go to it was supposed to go to the strong room, no, to Aj. Mother to to um to which was Chodri only. Nigga boy. to connect uh, uh it will take around a minute i request dr deepak shrivastav sir and dr murli dhar sir to uh tide over that period sir could you please share your experiences dr deepak shrivastav sir and murli dhar sir it's interesting to note that uh that kind of high altitude how the the laparoscope uh they're using it and all how difficult it has been for the uh, not only for surgical team but for us also to man uh, like manage uh, because the question here is uh, people living at that high altitude we always think that because of low oxygen level and all those things we don't know about the, uh, the status of the pulmonary hypertension or i don't know what kind of honestly i i not i know because i had been to andamanic over stayed there for about a week's time that's okay no but it's one more calling more like uh, or Chennai, so not much of problem over there, but of course, a lot of green tea and all. But coming to altitude, because we have altitude sickness, and I don't know how you manage the oxygen cylinders, the pressure, the laparoscopic pressure, how much it might alter the dynamics and all. Honestly, we don't have personal experience in that one. So it's interesting the way it was it was going on because we all don't read about that, but like, you know, like, you know, what are the low oxygen pressure, what you might uh, encounter, let us probably. People staying there, maybe they're adopted and all those things. But if, if somebody from PJ Chandigarh or maybe AIMS was coming, helping you, how are they feeling at that time? I, do, I really don't know. I really don't know. Because they also have to feel be comfortable. Because unless the doctor is comfortable, how can he uh, take a patient? But or maybe there's something like you, uh, you might be giving uh, something called as a acclimatization period or something like that when they're helping you out. Of course, you are used to it for a longer time. But of course, laparoscopy and all those things, I don't know about the gases and all, how are they managing or sorry, just the same thing, what works in the plain lands of it. I would like the plains, I would like to say plains, that's in this, across India, uh, also Ladakh, I don't know, the pressures wise and all. Apart from the 
patient herself or maybe himself dynamics what is your thought sir yeah uh, so uh, actually it's a very very interesting study you know <clears throat> uh, high altitude uh, illnesses are very well known and but interestingly people who are resident there they are not affected by it and uh, uh, and we uh, we are seeing so many cases of uh, our soldiers uh, getting thromboembolic complications in fact the, one of the papers from arjun is about uh, uh, thromboembolism in our patients are getting uh, mi our soldiers are getting mi in a very very young age i have seen here uh, you know so many cases of uh, thromboembolic complications uh, it will be interesting to see uh, what dr morup study which is uh, which i think is, is a very very interesting one uh, considering that he has used a te for the um, for the quantification of these changes and he has done it in the residents it will be interesting to see how the residents uh, of uh, uh, leh uh, compare the you know the parameters compare with the uh, people in the um, though his findings are more or less similar but it'll be interesting to see in terms of quantification and i wish if, if he's here he could answer uh, this question how uh, how are these uh, parameters of pulmonary hypertension or in uh, you know uh, the, the various changes that laparoscopy uh, has uh, produces uh, laparoscopy produces in uh, uh, pneumoperitoneal produces in uh, the residents of uh, lay uh, so if you have some an elementary idea from the study they'll be interesting to know i'm sure there will be but but the fact one fact is very clear that most of the changes are seen surprisingly in the residents uh, sorry in the in people who are inducted from the planes to the high altitude and they are there for some time and that's one in, in fact that's one dilemma that we have uh, these days and we are particularly worried about the thromboembolic complications uh, so dr morup if you your findings in the study were they any different from uh, uh, you know the residents uh, in planes uh, in laparoscopy surgeries because that uh, that's one area where there are a lot of gap in the uh, information also Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, the the cases we did over here is more or less are highlanders. So then, after that, we did a comparative study. The same cases, uh, you know, the lowlanders who comes over here in this, we uh, got done some emergency surgeries. A uh, lowlanders yeah. who comes over here and immediately have to go for some laparoscopic and some other surgeries. So in that, uh, we did it, but we didn't find much changes over here. The only one important thing is the. SPU2 is more or less concerned because they are under the face of adaptability. So the, we did some uh, GA cases like uh, laparotomy and other things with the SPU2 around about uh, 60 to a, a 75, something like that. Because no sooner they came over here, one got a splenic infarction, so we have to take out the spleen and other gets with some rupture of uh, some uh, tubes. So he, she was traveling in by air, so no sooner she landed over there, she did uh, some um, this uh, tubing rupture of some gynecological cases. We, we did some laparoscopic surgery, but in that the sp2 was very drop and pulmonary artery hypertension but definitely over there while doing some echo but it was a transitory so we didn't have much uh, you know cases over over here like that okay i uh, i put uh, i hate to interrupt you sir but i think sir has a uh, no, no, connection no, no, no. back then can we please resume please. the uh, cme please, please. with your permission sir please go ahead please go ahead. Yeah, sure. thank you so much sir and we here by sharing our experiences of the effect of the laparoscopy on hemodynamics with the help of the tee at high altitude in three patients um, yeah in three patients now <clears throat> whatever we took uh, three patients all the patients are of three uh, you know asa1 grade and uh, we did it in altitude of 3500 meter at this lay is uh, yeah so, as you all know uh, and the surgeries I, were performed uh, under the general anesthesia yeah. with uh, continuous monitoring of, of the tee uh, tte mm -hmm. there's a trans esophageal echocardiography as well as there is the trans thoracic echocardiography and uh, pulse oximeter invasive systemic blood pressure and capnography anesthesia was induced and maintained as per the institutional protocol and uh, patients were ventilated using vcv mode uh, with tidal volume of 8 ml per kg and the peep of 5 mm of uh, centimeter water and the respiratory rate was adjusted to maintain the etcu2 of 35 mm of the mercury and a tee prop um, tte prop uh, was inserted after desufflation of the stomach contents and the pneumoperitoneum was instituted and maintained by continuous insufflation of the carbon dioxide Various parameters were measured by the echocardiography, which included left ventricular ejection fraction, left ventricular outflow tract, and uh, velocity type in, uh, in integral time, cardiac output, 
and uh, pulmonary acceleration time. And the baseline echo parameters before the induction of the anesthesia was done with the transthoracic echocardiography probe. Yeah, then TEE was done by an experienced echocardiographer. And um, uh, the mean arterial pressure, heart rate, SpO2, and the ETC2 were also noted. <clears throat> These parameters were recorded at 10 uh, times points before induction of the anesthesia, that is T1, after, in, after induction, that is before insufflation, that is T2, after positioning, that is T3, and at 5 mm of the pneumoperitoneum T4, 10 mm of the pneumoperitoneum T5, and 14 mm of the pneumoperitoneum, that is T6, and the 10 minutes after 14 mm of the pneumoperitoneum, that is we call as T7, and 20 minutes after 14 mm of the mercury, and uh, that's pneumoperitoneum, that is the T8, and the T, uh, T9 is uh, 30 minutes after 14 mm, and the T10 is uh, 5 minutes after desaturation. And the results uh, we found here, <clears throat> and you can see the three patients we did over here, and the first patient is 29 years, female, uh, which is a gallstones patient and we did the laparoscopic cholecystectomy it is done in the reverse tender lumbar positions and the second is the second patient is 42 years female and that's of the uterine fibroid and the laparoscopic uh, vaginal hysterectomy and tend uh, in tender lumbar position and the third patient is 60 years male uh, which is having an indirect inguinal hernia and we did laparoscopic herniotomy with a mesh repair tender lumbar position Now in this slide you can see the patient number one, two, and three. And uh, after the positioning, you know the patient number one we did in the reverse tender lumbar position, and second and the third we did in the tender lumbar position. So it's the reverse tender lumbar positions in patient number one. You can see the cardiac output. There is a decrease in the cardiac output, whereas this uh, there is a slight increase in the cardiac output in patient number second and the third. And uh, this. Uh, Mouse yeah, and, and this is the slide number of first which shows the eco uh, you know, parameters measured at different times at one interval. Um, different time in laparoscopic surgeries um, where you can see the cardiac output decrease in the cardiac output as well as the, you know, left ventricular outflow tract. This, this is the second slide which shows the echo uh, cardiographic uh, parameters measured at different times one interval in laparoscopic vaginal hysterectomy where there is a which we did in the tendon uh, tendon positions where there is no decrease in the direct output and similarly the third patients where there is a parameters are remaining the same you know so so this is your uh, guidelines for the hemodynamic assessment during laparoscopic surgeries of the TEE and uh, now the one is that uh, we found a decrease in the mean arterial pressure left ventricular flow tract and velocity time integral and cardiac output after the pneumoperitoneum when associated with the reverse uh, tender and bulk positions and second an increase in the mean arterial pressure LVOT VTI and cardiac output when associated with the tender and bulk positions and the RV systolic function and TAPSA, left ventricular ejection fraction and left ventricular diastolic function remain the same throughout the procedure in all the three patients. And pulmonary artery acceleration time gradually decreased after pneumoperitoneum in all the three patients but stayed in the normal range throughout the procedure. The results of our study are consistent with the previous studies performed at the C level. Uh, a slow decline in the pulmonary hypertension after birth was observed in the highlanders when compared to the lowlanders due to the delayed remolding of the distal pulmonary vasculatures. The increased amount of the smooth muscle cells in the distal pulmonary arteries and the arterioles are considered the primary reasons for the pulmonary hypertension in a healthy uh, highlanders also. Uh, but the vasoconstrictions, hypervolumia, polycythemia, and increased blood viscosity due to the hypoxemia places a, place a secondary important factors for the development of the pulmonary hypertension in highlanders. However, all these findings become exaggerated when healthy highlanders lose their ability for adaptations and can develop congestive heart failures. 
the cardiovascular changes associated with the pneumoperitoneum will depend upon the patient's uh, laparoscopic surgeries are associated with the four potential major physiological changes in the anesthetized patients which includes your tendon bugs oblique rt positions and creation of the pneumoperitoneum systemic absorption of the carbon dioxide and desuppuration of the pneumoperitoneum the cardiovascular changes may be influenced by the patient's age the extent of the tilt intravascular volume status anesthetic drugs ventilation technique and associated cardiac disease in tendelenburg as well as the rt positions now the dorsen et al concluded that the hemoperitoneum alone has minimal hemodynamic effects and so at 11% uh, decrease in the cardiac index after uh, the uh, additions of the rt you know um, uh, positions and uh, but then uh, jorus and rural found that 50% decrease in the cardiac index in healthy young uh, patients uh, with the combined effect of the anesthesia rt positions and the hemoperitoneum the counteract these uh, to counteract these effects measures such as the volume loading or uh, rt positioning can help to preventing a decrease in the systemic vascular resistance in our patients the adoptions of the tendelenburg positions in patient number 2 and 3 was not associated with the significant cardiovascular changes whereas rt positioning in patient number 1 was associated with a decrease in the mean arterial pressure lvrt vt and cardiac output probably due to the gravitational effect on when as written now we have found that a mean decrease in the cardiac output by the A mean decrease in the cardiac output by 17% was noted by the Lens Center after insufflation of the 4 to 5 liters of the cardiac, uh, you know, carbon dioxide while in Tendelenburg positions. And similar study noticed a 30 to 40% reduction in the cardiac index after the CO2 insufflations. However, a study done by the Joshi et al. saw a uh, preserved cardiac index measured by TEE Doppler uh, at intra-abdominal pressure of uh, 12 to 15 millimeter of mercury. In healthy individuals, cardiovascular alternations due to the hemoperitoneum and carbon dioxide absorptions are well tolerated. However, its effect on healthy individuals um, living at a high altitude is not yet studied much. The cardiovascular parameters in patient number 2 and 3 were stable even after the pneumoperitoneum in the current study, which may be due to the adoption of the Tendelenburg positions. Whereas in patient number one, there is a decrease in the mean arterial pressure, LVOT, VTI, and cardiac output at uh, time point three, uh, two, as well as the four and the five, which may be attributed to the RT positioning, which was further aggravated by the pneumoperitoneum. However, the hemodynamics becomes stable after the administration of the intravenous fluids, and the LVET, LVEF ejection fracture in our study remains stable throughout the procedure in all the three patients. Now, these results are consistent with the Cunningham et al. and the DU and GO et al. as determined by the TEE. In contrast to these studies, uh, the Ramos et al. showed a significant decrease in the LVEF after the pneumoperitoneum in relation with the period um, to the period before CO2 insufflations. However, they included the older populations and saw only a minimal fall in the LVEF that is around about a 5 percent. You know, and the now the important point is that here is the uh, PAAT pulmonary artery acceleration time, which is a uh, surrogate marker of the pulmonary artery hypertension gradually decreased after the ins uh, installations of the pneumoperitoneum in all the three patients, which may be attributed to the CO2 absorptions or due to the increased peak air or pressure, which increases the pulmonary vascular, uh, vascular resistances. However, it was always maintained in the normal range. Now, uh, before coming to the summary, you know, I would like to point out here, the, the summary point out here is the present study showed that laparoscopic surgeries 
may be safely performed in healthy individuals at high altitude number one and number second however the study was you know limited by uh, only having a small sample size and done only in the healthy subjects hence uh, you know this this study this sort of studies with a large sample size with various morbidities at high altitudes are warranted thank you very much Uh, so thank you, Dr. Moruk, for your uh, I would say very innovative study, really. Because uh, uh, thank you, sir. First of all, uh, thank you, sir. Yeah, um, thank you, sir. You know, doing uh, <laughs> these parameters uh, with the TE that's one, but it's also at the yes. same time. Though you said you studied only three patients, so one question is whether you did these these three patients were Highlanders or uh, <clears throat> or or yeah. um, they were um, uh, you know the Lowlanders who been acclimatized. So that's one question from me. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all, all, all the three patients are Highlanders. They are somewhere Highlanders. from the within the range of the lay itself, but they were not from these uh, Pangong and other parts. They are very, very Highlanders. So we did this right. study in the patients who are within the resident of Leh Ladakh, sir. Okay, so that's great. So intuitively, I would think that their cardiac, uh, you know, system is much more robust than the Lowlanders. Uh, exactly. uh, so as, as I said, that uh, there is a very interesting uh, research opportunity. You have TEE sure. and maybe you can, uh, and there is a gap in the literature because most of the high altitude medicine literature comes from the Swiss Alps and they're not even 3000 meter high, you know, or even less than that. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, we can have uh, some data now, since you've taken a very interesting, uh, you know, um, uh, methodology you followed using TEE, maybe we can have some baseline in the Highlanders. I would think that sure, they, sure. Have, uh, uh, they have a uh, higher incidence of pulmonary <laughs> hypertension, which protects them against the, uh, against uh, uh, hypoxia and uh, exactly, sir. and probably their response to pneumoperitoneum is much better than the lowlanders. So maybe we can have exactly, some more sir. study on this. Uh, nonetheless, yes, very, very interesting study. If there are any questions, uh, I don't see any in the chat box. Uh, maybe we, we can have some more questions later. Uh, uh, Dr. Joshi, if you have any comments to make. And, no, I, I don't know about the time factor and Dr. Farul, I think she's... Uh... And so can we start with the second lecture? Yeah, exactly. Like I, can make, I, I can make out from your face. Yes. Thank you, sir. Sir, please just be around, sir, please, because I still I have some more questions yes, for Ladakh people. So please. Absolutely. Hang on, yes, hang sir, on. Sir, sir. Hang on. I'm here. I'm here, sir. Yeah, yeah, sir. Yeah. Uh, it's my honor and privilege to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Lieutenant Colonel Arjun Joshi. I would say it's a pleasure because he's a student from our medical college. Himalayan Hospital, Dehradun. At present, he is a graded specialist in anesthesiology, 153 General Hospital, Lay. He's done his MBBS from HIMS Jolly Grant and DNB from BHDC from 2016 to 2019. And he has seven publications to his name. Thank you so much. And uh, can we have, sir? Good morning, everybody. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Arjun Joshi, and today I'll be speaking about the management of a case of massive pulmonary thromboembolism that we did while I was posted at 153 oh, General Hospital you at Leh. Yep. We'll yes, start sir. that. The yes, patient uh, that we received was is a 36 year old male who is serving in the armed forces and has got no comorbidities, was stationed at an altitude of 15,500 feet. This individual was inducted at that altitude. On December 2021 and uh, had been in that area for roughly around a period of three uh, months that's roughly around 90 days when he had presented to our hospital with complaints of breathlessness cough and chest pain the durations of which have been uh, mentioned on the screen now whenever such a patient with these complaints come to you in that hospital the most likely diagnosis that is always uh, present as one of the differentials in your mind is pulmonary thromboembolism we did take the, uh, the history and the relevant history and did uh, perform the clinical examination of the patient uh, that you can see is on the screen. Uh, apart from a high BP of 150 by 110, a raised uh, pulse rate of 120 per minute and a rapid uh, shallow breathing of uh, 40 per minute, 
and the SPO2 which was around 80% of room air and uh, around 94% with oxygen and face mask there was uh, none of the uh, none of the other uh, uh, investigations or examinations were seeming to uh, be pointing out towards any other uh, involvement of any other system that might have been the reason for such a clinical presentation on auscultation there was a loud p2 uh, was heard and uh, the s1 and s2 and the loud s1 was also heard which is uh, uh, more or less a uh, common finding present in the pte uh, uh, we did uh, do the relevant investigations and on uh, any such patient presenting to us in trauma uh, we go for fdps d dimers and other exam investigations to rule out any other pathology that might associated now in the uh, apart from the fdp and the d dimers uh, the ecg was also uh, suggestive uh, though although uh, not a classical s1 q3 t3 pattern but we did uh, find uh, inverted t waves uh, in the uh, uh, lead 3 and other than that the ecg was more or less suggestive of a rv strain pattern the chest x-ray of the patient was done. Now this is chest x-ray, if you can see on the screen, is quite uh, relevant and um, is quite classical of what you see in the uh, pulmonary thromboembolism. I like to take the uh, uh, audience towards the uh, right descending pulmonary artery, which is quite dilated in this uh, case. Uh, there is a presence of a Hampton's hump, uh, which is a wedge-shaped opacity on the right lower lung. Sorry, uh, I'm sorry, I think we've lost the connections. Uh, may I request Naveen sir to uh, take care? So the questions are your own? Yeah, uh, we can take questions at this point. Yeah, yeah, not a problem, not a problem. Yes, sir. Yeah, Arjun, sir. Sir, Arjun, I think is not here, Rabi. Okay. Uh, it was a video recording. Uh, sir, you can uh, carry forward the question or any discussion you would like sir, to Dr. hold on. Dr. Uh, Abul? Sir, are you there? Dr. Moru? Dr. Moru. Dr. Moru, sir, can you unmute yourself, sir? Yeah, yeah, yes, I can hear you. Sir, yes, just, yes, yes. just want to understand what is the average hemoglobin in the. I'm, not, I'm talking of. I really like the word like highlander, lowlander. We say you are high altitude, we are at plains. And you, you corrected D, me. D, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you corrected me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. D, D, hemoglobin level at the highlander as compared to the lowlander is very much high over here. How much? And uh, yeah, yeah. The people who are uh, just living in the uh, Pangong Lake region, eastern part of the Ladakh. We have found their hemoglobin are ranging from the 16 to 20. And uh, and most of these people from the Highlander, especially so Eastern part of the Ladakh, they come to Central Hospital Lake just to donate the blood because their hemoglobin is very high, you know. It's very high Absolutely. because of the polycythemia and whatever. The so now, question is exactly, now, now, that is what exactly I wanted to hear the, because polycythemia, they donate and all those things, sir. Question here is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 There, there are two questions I'm going to ask simultaneously, sir. One is, a low lander like me comes there. Maybe sometimes I might come for sightseeing. I might have a, a fracture. <laughs> I might just yeah, order yeah, from yeah. the house, something like that. And and if my hemoglobin, I, 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 don't, I don't know what, what something, and probably Highlander comes there, and he has a fracture and blood loss. So when do you correct the blood loss? Sir? One is blood loss, and the second thing is fluid management. How much fluid? If somebody, Highlander, comes with hemoglobin of 14, do you think it has a anemia? That's what I'm asking you, sir, directly. <laughs> The anemic patients, yeah, the, 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 you know, 
anemic patients uh, about the you know if you compare the study of the anemic patients and the uh, other uh, you know increase in the hemoglobin level because of the polycythemia so far no any study has been carried out but the uh, especially the patients of the gynecological patients which are coming from the you know these highlanders so in that you find a little difficulties their hemoglobin level is whether it's because of the polycythemia or the nutritional anemia so there is a confusion in between these two so so far no study has been done about the anemic patients of the whether uh, the nutritional anemia in these highlanders how will you differentiate from the polycythemic anemia but uh, you know the adaptability is a very important factors but the people who are living in the lay in other region 3500 meters so they are not having too much hemoglobin over ever but their nutritional status of the anemia is very much much better so their actual hemoglobin level is around of around about a 13 to 14 mm of the mercury sir yeah. uh, sir murupur sir there is a question for you can you take a question sir dev uh, dr muthu kumar rajakopalan wants to ask you what precautions we should we should take in carbon dioxide pressures and altitude during pneumoperitoneum yeah actually what when we are giving a carbon dioxide level over here whatever the carbon dioxide level we are giving at the lower altitude the same parameters we have given not more than 40 mm of the mercury but then uh, when you say when you correct the hypoxemia by giving the 100% oxygen so i don't find any there any changes because of the carbon dioxide absorption so though there is a little pulmonary artery hypertension increases uh, but then uh, the decrease in the cardiac output and the lv uh, pulmonary artery you know this uh, blood pressure which managed by the iv intranasal fluid so carbon dioxide has no, so far we didn't find any relation with the low lenders and the high lenders about the insufflation of the carbon dioxide so we are given the same parameters as we had been giving in the low lenders sir another question for you is do we get a lot of cases of accidental hypothermia in your hospital and are these patients able to reach you in time yeah the hypothermia is concern uh, you are you know the ladakh hypothermia we think about the temperatures in uh, winter it goes up to minus 20 something like that minus 22 minus 25 but the people of the ladakh are well acquainted how to cope up with this uh, temperature so they are already so we don't get a much uh, uh, hypothermic patients the local citizens but uh, the patients who are alcoholic because most of the time the patients who are having an alcohol during the winter they because of an alcoholic intoxication they get uh, uh, stay somewhere outside and the, such cases we are doing in our hospitals otherwise as such if we compare the um, hypothermic patients in the winter and the summer we don't get a much hypothermic patients in our hospitals uh, yeah, from the any part of the ladakh because these people are very much no no they how to prevent the hypothermia and all these things they are already uh, you know they are already adapted they are already in worse with the you know in condition with how to cope up with this hypothermia we so, so but no doubt we are getting uh, the tourists who are coming to ladakh especially the winter tourists who do the chadar trek who are trekking on the icy sheets they get lots of frostbite frostbite you know gangrene and uh, some other uh, uh, local injuries they do get it but as the, these are the tourists who get comes in hypothermia as the local people they do come in they, they, they less hypothermic patients they don't come in like this you know okay thank you so much sir i think we've yeah, restored yeah, yeah. our uh, uh, internet connection can we after continue? that the patient was taken to the icu the uh, patient was uh, started on the treatment for lines of pulmonary thromboembolism Uh, however before that we did uh, perform a 2d echocardiography for that patient and the uh, 2d echocardiography was primarily done to rule out if there is any lv involvement also now when you see the uh, 2d echocardiography you can see that the rv is quite dilated as compared to the lv which is quite uh, compressed now there was hypokinesia in the right ventricular free wall there is hyperkinetic lv and uh, one more was more Uh, was the reason for performing this 2d echocardiography was because i wanted to ascertain that there is no lv involvement sir patient so the patient was thrombolyzed with injection uh, tenecteplase and uh, was given oxygen therapy uh 
post 12 hours of thrombolysis, uh, we could uh, see that the patient's oxygen requirement have increased. We had to shift him to an RBM uh, at 12 liters per minute. Although I even at that he was using his accessory muscles of respiration, there was an SpO2 to around 80%. We did perform an ABG in this patient. Uh, there was uh, an, um, uh, uh, features of type 1 uh, respiratory failure in this patient. The PO2 is 65.7 but let me uh, tell you that this uh, PO2 of 65.7 was still uh, present with the oxygen at face uh, using an RBM at 12 liters per minute. So, and there was, uh, um, res uh, there was respiratory uh, acidosis. Uh, in this uh, patient, uh, although the picture that you can see is uh, looking to be more of a metabolic component, uh, could be because the delivery of oxygen was getting hampered. There is a seemingly increased. So the challenges that the team uh, as a whole was facing in that altitude was that this patient is severely hypoxic. He has post thrombolysis. He's a thrombolytic failure. There is RV strain pattern. There are uh, features which are quite um, convincing that it's a case of PT. Uh, we had already started him on UFH um, and even with the uh, max of the uh, non-invasive uh, ventilatory supports, the things were not looking at a, a, a good. So uh, we decided that we have to um, do something about this gross VQ mismatch that is going on in this patient and uh, this is also correct that we could not evacuate that patient because uh, he was unstable for any sort of an evacuation. We wanted him to be stabilized first. So uh, what we went ahead was uh, we uh, placed our goals, we placed our interventions. Uh, now uh, the goals were quite clear that we'll start off, the initial was that we'll start off with invasive ventilatory support. The second was we have to do something about the VQ. Now there is not much that we could have done about the Q factor out that in that altitude. There was uh, no point of thinking about thrombectomies. That is not possible there. We could not evacuate the patient for a thrombectomy. So uh, we had to do somehow some uh, something that uh, would involve, improve the ventilatory aspect of that. Uh, one of the things that we had in our mind was that we have to either do a ventilatory support uh, we have we might have to do a proning proning of the patient uh, that uh, although is not uh, kind of written anywhere that it is going to help a patient in the PTE but certainly in this patient it did anyways uh, so the goals of the uh, uh, while uh, performing the invasive ventilatory support was that we will uh, involve some of the alveoli that are in the resting phase by promoting their recruitment we'll uh, promote some sort of an alkalosis we would like to p pressures pa pressures to go a bit low uh, the pro the problem however was that uh, um, we um, even at the setting of the hypoxemia with fio2 of 100% we could not achieve uh, spo2 of more than 82 83% and uh, we did do the proning of the patient but before proning we could not do the lung protective mechanism of ventilator involving the high peeps because the pa pressures were already high other than that we had instituted the calcium channel blockers uh, already we had uh, started the um, uh, to prevent the calcium channel blockers or primarily to prevent the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction further uh, we had started uh, him on sildenafil apple and we were uh, following all the other uh, uh, the ufs therapy was pdd guided we were following the fast track approach and uh, without wasting now much time, we'll, I'd like to take you to the, to the ABG slide that we performed on this patient. So uh, at 8.45 the next day of thrombolysis of the patient, uh, when the patient was decided to be intubated, his stats were, if you can see on the screen, the SpO2 was around 70%, pH was around 7.28 and the respiratory rate was 38. So at this point in time, the patient was started on a lung protective uh, ventilatory uh, parameter uh, mechanisms in which we did uh, select the tidal volume of 6 ml per kg. Uh, the minute ventilation was set at 22. Uh, he was uh, on the muscle paralyzers. He was adequately sedated. Um, but after that, uh, rather than uh, uh, showing some improvement when the, we did a perform an XABG at around 1300 hours, which was roughly around four hours uh, post intubation, we saw that although the SpO2 starts had marginally improved at 86%, the pH had gone down to 7.17, uh, PCO2 had risen, it was uh, basically a respiratory acidosis. 
सो एट दिस पॉइंट इन टाइम वी डिसाइडेड टू प्रोन द पेशेंट एंड इंक्रीज द मिनट वेंटिलेशन फ्रॉम ट्वेंटी टू इंक्रीज द मिनट वेंटिलेशन वी इंक्रीज द रेस्पिरेटरी रेट फ्रॉम ट्वेंटी टू टू ट्वेंटी फोर टाइटल वॉल्यूम वॉज स्टिल सेट एट सिक्स एम एल पर के जी uh if you see this next at 14 13 hours that is after 1 hour of proning we did see that the uh, ph of the patient had improved which was around 7.23 the spo2 had improved to 94% pco2 had come down to around 47.2 and there was an increase in the po2 as well with the similar supports that were uh, previously present now at this point in time uh, things were looking a bit better but the um, shift of the odc from uh, uh, the uh, Um, the shift of the odc was uh, quite significant because over a period of just 1 hour it had come from 7.17 to 7.23 uh, i did not want that the uh, uh, delivery of the oxygen to the tissue sh- should be um, the al- alkalosis should increase to an extent that the delivery is hampered so the rate was again uh, decreased from 24 to 22 a repeat abg was done at 4:15 16 15 hours which showed that the ph had improved uh, however at this point in time uh, because what we were following in the lung protective mechanism uh, ventilation was also a restricted uh, 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 restricted fluid support there was a decrease in uh, uh, blood pressure 90 by 54 and the serum creatinine also if you see it has risen from 1.06 to 1.45 over a period of just 2 hours now this i uh, was personally not uh, and the team as a whole was not very happy with because uh, there was uh, acute kidney injury and other than this there was also an increase in the one for, uh, po2 to 146.5 uh, uh, which will be you know uh, leading the patient towards more or less more towards the um, free radical injury so at this point in time we did start increase, decreasing the supports of the fio2 and the supports of the fio2 were uh, decreased by uh, 5% every 10 minutes till the target spo2 was still around 92 93 94% or more so we did a repeat abg uh, at 2100 hours um, after giving alcoch of fluid decreasing the fio2 and uh, keeping the urine output to around 1 to 1.5 ml per kg per hour and in that the uh, picture was looking a bit a shade better uh there was improvement in serum creatinine there was improvement in the po2 there was improvement in the blood pressure of the patient uh, was looking good a repeat abg again at 0400 um was again uh, showing a good response of the patient to the on the ventilator uh, and similarly when uh, the uh, reports the uh, clinical parameters of the patients were improving everything was looking better we decided to do the proning of the patient and uh, uh, sorry uh, my uh, apology we decided to supine the patient again and we did uh, uh, abg again after putting the patient on spontaneous mode of ventilation at 0900 hours uh, we did started decreasing the supports and we saw that the patient is improving and finally at 1115 hours the patient was extubated uh, so before extubating the patient i like you to see the comparatives of the echocardiography that we did and uh, now this in the first echo you can see the Uh, dilated no, RV, dilated. but no, in the second one the RV is uh, not that dilated. Its hypokinetic okay, has okay. reduced. The hyperkinetic LV, uh, the LV is not that hypokinetic. It is looking a bit better. The progress of treatment was good. And uh, we did perform a successful weaning after the patient, the patient was on spontaneous mode of ventilation. He was on. Getting a good tidal volume, and we had finally extubated the patient. He was starting on an RBM, and it uh, felt really great when the patient was was giving us a thumbs up sign that. everything is improving this slide shows the uh, relevant progress of the clinical uh, um, uh, clinical uh, things as well as the ventilatory supports that you can see on the screen and finally the patient was uh, evacuated to command hospital chandi mandir subsequently the next day we did uh, where the interventional radiology team uh, did an amazing job and they did the thrombectomy patient and uh, the subsequent slides show the classical pt signs and the signs that we saw in our own patient 
um uh, thankful for the entire team to have uh, managed this case excellently and uh, i'm sure that there are things that i would have done uh, that could have been better and i'm sure that there with time uh, we'll get wiser in treatment of such patients and i'm very thankful to be given this uh, platform as an opportunity to uh, uh, discuss what uh, ever we could achieve in that attitude thank you uh professor joshi sir would like to say something or no i think uh, i think he is not around i think probably uh, yeah so i just uh, had a telephone uh, telephony call he is in a low bandwidth area at the moment no no i understand i understand so i think it no, was very more of if is there is okay yeah don't uh, uh, as for i said for a while almost a presentation so one more presentation we have sir can we so move we on to that take question after that Yes, sir. Can we take questions after that, sir? Yeah, But yeah, Deepak, sir. sir, was making a point. Can we hear him from that? Yeah. So the point is that, uh, as I was uh, mentioning, uh, the lowlanders, you know, since uh, this uh, <laughs> word has got fancy of. <laughs> I really like. I like. I like the word. I like. So the we word. are on lowlanders, uh, and uh, the entire army is lowlander, in fact. And uh, when we reach uh, um, uh, in, in Northern Command area in Leh and uh, Ladakh area, within three months, our hemoglobin shoot up to eighteen to nineteen. Oh. and uh, uh, and this is one of the pro thrombotic uh, reasons uh, and our army hematologists in fact we have a high altitude research center in leh itself and they have now proven it beyond doubt that uh, uh, they are very prone for uh, thromboembolic events and what i'm happy about that uh, um, uh, all these patients like this was a uh, classical case where they are immediately subjected to thrombolysis and if the situation permits they are recommended downwards and they, uh, they are um, uh, subjected to thrombectomy but what we are right now grappled uh, grappled with the situation that we are trying to understand how we can pick up these patients early uh, so there is a screening program which we are trying to intervene maybe maybe uh, we are thinking of doing a d dimer as a screening uh, device method when they come and after 3 months and pick them up early because it's really disheartening to see these are all young people you know 20 to uh, 25 to you know 30 years and uh, but then uh, thankfully uh, we are able to achieve good outcome uh, with these uh, good interventions Uh, so that's what i would like to say i was talking regarding the fluid management uh, see that there is a very interesting uh, you know patient population we are treating with lowlanders 153 general hospital in leh and dr morup is treating with highlanders so i think there is a very good scope of uh, you know comparing uh, how the responses are going to be uh, you know doing uh, so so dr morup i'm giving a lot of ideas today right Uh, so, so i can conduct a study between the absolutely. lowland and highland why, and, why yeah. not why not why not absolutely so, so can so, 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 surprise in case somebody can twenty like you know hb for 20 and uh, are you going to do hemodilution and all this? so a lot of questions keep are coming in mind yes. but i think i respect parul this thing okay fine parul over so to can you. we start with the third presentation please please, yes. please, please go ahead before uh, our third speaker today is surgeon commander arjit ray He is working at the Naval Hospital Boat Player, and he has given presentation at various state and national conferences. Thank you so much, and may I request Naveen sir to kindly share the screen. greetings to one and all from the emerald islands this is the southernmost point of india here the uh, tricolor was hoisted for the first time uh, by netaji in uh, 1943 this place is home to the cellular jail ross island this this archipelago is very rich in flora and fauna and uh, the group of islands has innumerable places of tourist attraction in uh, other words this place is a tropical paradise however lately there has been trouble brewing up in this paradise with obese patients presenting with difficult spine and difficulty in performing neuraxial block however these difficult cases have been tackled by using pre procedural <coughs> ultrasound scanning today i will keep in front of the forum 
three such cases of obese patients with difficult spine. Clearly, patients with large BMI present with a difficulty in clinical scenario where you want to perform a subarachnoid block and yet this, these patients benefit uh, from spinal anesthesia and avoidance of general anesthesia. The difficulties entered, encountered in obese are the locations, the landmarks are uncertain. The depth to the vertebral canal or the subarachnoid space is uncertain. There is difficulty in patient positioning. Also, traumatic placement of the spinal needle and multiple attempts during a neuraxial block have been related to numerous complications like PDPH. In addition, multiple punctures are associated with pain, patient discomfort and bad experience. Recently, we have had three <coughs> obese class 3 patients with difficult spine listed for various surgeries under spinal anesthesia. The first case is a 32 year old lady listed for elective LSES. Her weight was 97.4 kgs with a BMI of 42.16. The second case is a 25 year old lady weighing 108.2 kgs with BMI of 42.2. Uh, she was listed for uh, emergency LSES. The third case <clears throat> is a male 63 year old weighing 120 kgs with a BMI of 41.5. He had perianal abscess and was listed for examination under anesthesia and proceed. The anesthesia technique in all the three cases was <clears throat> subarachnoid neuraxial block in the sitting position. For each case, a pre-procedural ultrasound scan of the spine was done using the linear probe of GEV scan extend portable USG machine. The depth was set at maximum, that is 9 cm, and luckily the subarachnoid space in all the three cases were identified and measured to be within 8 cm, the deepest being in the third case which was 7.2 cm. A 26 gauge quinky needle was used for both the LSES cases and 25 gauge quinky needle was used for the third case. The needles were of the standard 90 mm length. The advantages of uh, conducting a pre-procedural scan is that it offers uh, to help to locate the midline by locating the, spinal, uh, the spinous processes. It helps us to locate the intervertebral levels and the spaces. The depth uh, at which the subarachnoid space can be located and can be determined to see the needle length which we have to introduce inside. It also helps us to identify any rotational deformity of the vertebrae. Some uh, general principles of ultrasound imaging uh, while uh, doing ultrasound scanning of obese patient is that the depth of the scan, the depth has to be set at the proper level, the frequency <clears throat> and the gain has all to be, are also to be uh, set. Uh, while scanning, apply gentle pressure with the probe because this will reduce the distance to the target and it, it does improve the image quality. And most importantly, practice on normal subjects because to recognize the pattern uh, is the key. Elaborating on the scanning technique, two views were used. The parasagital oblique view was used to identify and locate the lamina and identify the interlamina space. The transverse interspinous view was used to locate the midline and get an idea about the depth at which the intrathecal space can be located. Using these two views, we see in the third case uh, the spines L2, L3 and L4 were marked in the midline and the L3, L4 space was quite defined. Thus, a successful spinal tap was obtained in all the three cases in the first attempt. So, take home points are that a careful pre-anesthetic clinical examination of the patients 
is very important to anticipate a difficult spine and to plan accordingly. A pre-procedural ultrasound uh, scan indeed helps with difficult spine and uh, good needle handling is fundamental to success. Thank you. First of all, before the discussions go on, I express my regrets for some uh, technical things happening at my computer. To be honest, it has been on since last three days non-stop. So it got hit it and the system got <laughs> logged in between. So I wish to be excused for the same. Over to Dr. Muldar Joshi and Dr. Deepak Shirvastar sir to carry forward the discussions. But I must compliment, I thoroughly enjoyed listening to all the three speakers. They, they are sharing their experiences with the, which they face the challenges they face day in and day out, whether it is a pulmonary thromboembolism management case followed by evacuation and thrombectomy, or it's uh, a laparoscopic surgery in a high altitude, the TE findings, and uh, the use of uh, ultrasound for locating the spine and anatomy. Over to you, Dr. Mulitha Joshi and Dr. Deepak Shivastra, sir, please. Joshi, sir, please. Uh, <laughs> sir. I have so many questions, bro, that you become a CME, honestly. The question is basically trying to understand their systems are the working and all, how they're able to cope with it and all. I'll, I'll come back to the uh, first of all, before I should congratulate uh, uh, Dr. Sorry, uh, from uh, Fort Blair. Dr. Arjit. Dr. Arjit. Dr. Arjit. Uh, Dr. Arjit, are you there? No, he's also not there. The trouble no, is no, that no. they're doing good analysis of work, but they don't have no, the bandwidth. No, no, question here is, question <laughs> I, I the bandwidth. to ask whether the reason being is because I had been to that place. I had been to have like, you know, all the, what are the places uh, he has yes. mentioned, it was there. Then our only, our only help for our local guardian is Dr. Morup. Dr. Morup, all the questions will come to you. Please keep on helping us. Yes, yes, yes. Say, yes. say for example, somebody, uh, say, for example, uh, due to electric cases also at your hospital or only emergency, sir? And you didn't lab cool and all. I'm talking op open surgeries, open surgeries. Yeah, yeah, we do, we do the open surgery. Ingo and hernia, patient comes hemoglobin 22. Do you uh, go for hemodilution kind of thing by like, you know, uh, what should I like a blood donation and then diluting the blood and going for like, how, how do you go about it? Because it's interesting for us to understand. We are lowlanders, sir. We are higher highlanders. You have to tell me. Hemoglobin 22 for ingo and hernia. Yeah, yeah, the Highlanders, uh, which uh, come to our hospitals who are supposed to go for college hysterectomy under GA or any other major surgery under GA. So we try to, yes, uh, we are uh, sometimes emergency cases, we are doing a uh, case of hemoglobin more than 15, but usually we keep the parameters of hemoglobin around about uh, 15 to 16. So these people, and they come to us uh, by and they donate the blood before going for the stage uh, one or two weeks before. So that's the uh, ideal thing we are doing at our hospital. So these Highlanders who with the hemoglobin of uh, more than 20, they come to our hospital. We just make a uh, go for the blood donation and all these things. And when the hemoglobin level comes to our whatever seen something like that, then we go for the GNSC uh, to be on the paper side. Because we try to reduce the polysaturated articles also. Yes, that's what we do in our uh, routine practice over here. Yes, yes. It could be. Answered. Second question is what do you consider anemia? In, what do you consider anemia in Highlanders, sir? You, I've talked about the system. What is anemia definition in Highlanders? Yeah, anemia. So that's earlier I talked about, about regarding the anemia. So most of these anemia cases, they are dealing with these uh, medical specialists and the uh, gynecologist people who are dealing with the nutritional anemia and the anemia, whether this anemia is because of the nutritional anemia uh, or because they are already getting a polysaturated or hemoglobin level is maybe on the higher side. So if there is a nutritional uh, deficiency, how will you differentiate the nutritional anemia with the polysaturated, uh, which uh, usually overshows the hemoglobin level on the higher side? So these are being usually managed by the gynecologist and the medical specialist. But uh, nutritional anemia is definitely very high in the <coughs> highland. They don't get the fresh vegetables and the other eatable items are less, especially in the eastern part of the Ladakh. But we are also getting the nutritional anemia. So these two are especially the uh, uh, so obstetric patients. They are definitely having the nutritional anemia. 
So in this, we don't find much uh, polysaccharide type of the you know uh, level uh, high hemoglobin level. So they are living in the high range. So this is one of the amazing things we have seen in our study. Yes. Yeah. No, I still a lot of I, have, I still have a lot of questions, but I would like to give it back to the uh, chair because I think uh, it's important that we have to hear from the other people who also uh, participated in discussion. Over to you, Dr. Parul and Dr. Naveen. Uh, sir, there is a question by Dr. Anita Kohli, ma'am. She says, because of the high hematocrit, is there a protocol for avoiding post-operative thromboembolic complications in your hospital? Dr. Moruk, in sir? Our, in Sonam Hospital. At your hospital, sir? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Thromboembolic, uh, the thromboembolic especially the... Uh, you know, we have been uh, dealing with the MI cases over here. So then getting the uh, embolus. So under such uh, conditions, we have a medical specialist as well as the intensity of physician and with the anesthesiologist also, we are doing this uh, thrombolysis, but we don't have any cat lab uh, protocol in our hospital. So whatever MI cases, from the embolism cases, we are doing if it is comes to know Especially the MI cases, we are doing the thrombol acid in our hospitals with this issue management. And, uh, uh, and uh, um, so some cases of the such like uh, other cases, we have to open it. Uh, they are complaining of the pain, abdomen, and many other conditions. When you open this, we find lots of thrombosis in their, uh, you know, these mesentric arteries. We did some surgeries over here, and they are, are highly related chronic mountain sickness from the embolism. So some surgical corrections and the medical management we are doing over here by thrombolysis. So this is the protocol we are doing over here. Thank you so much, sir. We don't have any more questions from the audience. But Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we don't have any more questions, but we have a beautiful comment from our uh, audience. They say that only IEC can think of bringing northernmost and the southernmost academicians in this forum and hats off to ISA. And with that, I request Naveen, sir, to please take over. Thank you, sir. A, uh, I'll give an opportunity. Now everybody can unmute himself or herself and uh, interact with Dr. Muru or the chairpersons. So before we wind up, uh, if anybody wants to express he or she can unmute himself for us. I must place on record the uh, good coordination done by Colonel Anwar Garg also in uh, arranging these videos and getting them recorded and sending it to me across uh, in last couple of days. I was uh, after him and, uh, and I also thank uh, Dr. Deepak Shirvastav and his team for the pleasure. Uh, Yes, I'm right in lot of uh, um, hard work, certainly. Thank you, sir. And, and for, for... Uh, he, he got your recording done, sir, I know, because there were challenges that you may not be able to come live because of internet issues. But thank you yeah. for, for, for joining us today. Yeah. And and we and we look, we, we are very happy to listen that you are very keen to host an ISA event, a, a gathering of anesthesiologists in uh, yes. Leila Dak and uh, we'll definitely support it in all possible ways, not only financially, but also morally and physically and uh, in all logistically also. And it will be a pleasure to be there uh, at your SNM hospital and uh, yes. see, see some live uh, procedures being done and maybe some yes. sort of interaction also along with academics and definitely yes. uh, a dip in Pangongso. Okay, <laughs> we will uh, take the challenge Absolutely. of take, taking a dip uh, in Pangongso Lake. And uh, yes. uh, I also thank uh, Dr. Parul and Dr. Nishant and Dr. Monica and uh, Dr. Jyotsna uh, for their uh, support. And uh, before I think it's, ti or it's time to uh, conclude today's session, see you all on. Uh, Wednesday onwards yeah. for the I, uh, ISACON 2022 at Shillong for the workshops and the subsequently uh, CME on Thursday and Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the main conference. Uh, enjoy the academics as well as the... Uh, uh, over to you. I'll, I'll come to you, sir. I want to, uh, finally, final comments, I'll come to you. And uh, <coughs> enjoy the academics as well as the beauty of the Northeast. Uh, Dr. Venkatgiri, please.
Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, see, what I, uh, two things which I could not do uh, during my relationship was one was going to Kashmir having a CME there. Another one is going to Northeast, those places mm -hmm. having a CME there. Because Northeast, yes, we have a problem, but uh, difficult. Anyway, during uh, next year, is, uh, my niece as academic chairman, definitely we will uh, plan for that, put budget to be approved in this general body, add something. And let us give something more than that because it is a difficult area and they will have difficulties in getting this thing and all. And people who are interested can come there and we have a CME there and people can actually know what's happening there. That, that is what is important. Not that uh, we're sitting here and uh, uh, hearing is different and going and experiencing. Uh, uh, we can definitely plan that. We are not having any dearth of money, but for their service, people who have to go have to go on their own. But for their making, definitely we can make that. We will put for the council and general body and get uh, something more of that and plan a budget. One has said uh, Srinagar, we planned one, Leh Ladakh, that area, and definitely in the southmost point uh, there also. See, different areas, because we have DSA and all with them, because people know that what's happening in military also, because we are civilians, we have so much exposure, we do not have anything. Exposure of that, know that what's actually happening and what the difficulties, because sometimes we also have to see that, we do not know that. And uh, definitely with the uh, warfare and all more, that civilians also may be called sometimes. You should know that. Let us who are interested can go there. At least the office bearers and other people should know that and others interested. We can, please, uh, uh, we have some another, uh, you have six hours time to, or 12 hours time to leave tomorrow morning. To let them add something to the budget and uh, make that and we will make that uh, something there. So that uh, uh, with the support of this thing, uh, it's interesting, we'll do that. That should be. People have to come by their own, but we will support for their infrastructure and all other things, whatever is that, we will do that and for that. And but but, it and the, but, but, but uh, the point is very well taken and I'm very happy to share with you that uh, we may probably meet in Srinagar in the uh, last weekend, Christmas weekend, Eve uh, in Srinagar in Skims and also uh, from uh, in Thirupura, uh, the Bhaskar Majumdar planning to do a workshop. Also in Aswal, Mizoram team going there, and uh, definitely uh, today, uh, I think uh, Dr. Morup has shown his keen interest. So uh, I think maybe uh, May June will be a good month to so come there, sir. Or, or yes, earlier. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In May, in May, May lots of tourists, but uh, we can come over here, sir. But May season is good. Season is good. Then yeah. for the uh, for the academic activity under the banner of ISA under your leadership there. Very good. Yeah. May June is good. Planning May. So okay, yeah, then you will definitely uh, uh, our aim is to promote and uh, promote yeah, I mean, academics, yeah, clinics, and welfare. Well I just want to say thank you for making the first event of this uh, one day evening uh, Sunday session also last event of mine. Committee, a memorable one. Uh, thank you, one and all. Uh, thank you. We, we will ignore you also, Joshi ji. Next no, 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 no,